Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, you know, I was sitting here this morning, I was saying to Steve uh, when we were sitting here, it's really refreshing because I get to be in all kinds of different circumstances and it's wonderful to be someplace where people are having conversations that are beyond the Diversity 101 conversation. So I really want to acknowledge you for what you've done. And, uh, you know, we were watching this morning and, we, you know, we started with the Did You Know video, which gave us all that information about the way the world's changing. And, of course, Walker did his incredible, you know, collection of statistics from the Yankelovich piece. And then we heard from all the other folks who've been on stage. And, you know, my guess is that if I asked the question, is there anybody here who doesn't believe we need to pay attention for diversity, there wouldn't be many hands that go up. And I don't mean just because you'd be embarrassed. I mean because it's pretty compelling. And at the same time, we also hear things like, uh, you know, when, when Dave was talking about or showed us the film of the uh, you know, Spanish language commercial for, uh, for Olive Garden, my guess is it's not that when people think about, gee, should we market our Italian food to Latinos, people say, nah, they wouldn't be interested. It just it doesn't occur to us. I was just talking at lunch with somebody. I was saying I remember a number of years ago I was leading a course out here in Marietta, or as I guess they call it Marietta. But, um, you know, for, for Tyco and, and for one of the factories there, and there were, there were a large number of people in the factory who spoke Spanish but very little English. So in the course, they had people being translated, you know, with the, like in the UN, some of the participants. And we were waiting for the translator to come, and, a, and a, a Vietnamese woman comes up to me before the course and says, are you looking for the translator? And I said, yeah. And she said, it's me. Now, logically, of course, there are people who trilingual. Was I being racist when I didn't? think of her that way, or was it just not in my consciousness that that's how it could occur? And that's the one piece I want to talk to you about, which is both individual, as Sandy said, but also in terms of how we see the market, are we missing things? But then the other question, which I think really provokes our thinking, is given the attention that you've put here and the success that you've had here as a company, the things that you're doing, which are way ahead of most people in the marketplace, how is it that things like we just heard still show up? You see. My guess is that most people who are involved in the things that we heard don't do those things on purpose. And that requires a shift in the way we think about the subject of diversity. Not just the content, but the subject of diversity. Now, we know that there are lots of studies. Um, some of you are very familiar, for example, with the Implicit Association Test, which was created at Harvard, the University of Virginia, and the University of Washington. If you haven't tried it, if you just jot down Implicit Association Test and Google it, it's a free test that you can do online. And it'll give you a chance to do any one of 20 different combinations. And it gives you feedback. It's designed based on computer technology to give you feedback. And so what, what are your unconscious or subconscious reactions to one group versus another? Now, I caution you that sometimes it's confronting. We learn things about ourselves that we didn't know. That's why they call it the unconscious, right? But sometimes they're directly counter to the things that we believe about ourselves. And it takes a willingness to be in uncertainty to listen to that and not be defensive about it. But we have a number of other studies that, that we've seen about this. One, many of you are very familiar with. Anybody, who here read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink? A number of people, good. So you remember he talked about this study. Ian Ayers, who's a professor now at Yale University when he was at the University of Chicago in the 90s, sent a group of actors and actresses out into car dealerships. Um, they were virtually identical in every way possible except for their race and gender. Some were white men, some white women, some black men, some black women. They went to the same car dealership, the same salesman to buy the exact same car. White men on average were offered the car $725 over invoice price. White women $935, 30% more. Black women $1,195, 70% more. And black men offered the same cars by the same car salesman $1,687 over invoice price, 225%. Now, when I talked to him, he said, that wasn't the thing that shocked us the most. What shocked us the most when we sent psychologists out to interview the car salesman, and these folks know how to do interviews without people, without people knowing what they're going for, he said they came to believe that almost none of the car salesmen had any conscious idea that there was a pattern in what they were doing. Now, I have to tell you, I was very skeptical about that, even a little cynical when I heard about it, until I had an opportunity to work in a car dealership. A friend of mine is a labor attorney, and he asked me to work with one of his clients because they were having some staff development issues. Let me tell you, it is the rawest environment you could possibly work in. Car salesmen don't care about anything except getting their name on the commission board. They will sell a car to Genghis Khan if they get a commission, <laughs> right? So how does it happen? They make hundreds of micro decisions all the time. 
numbers of different things that sort people out all the time so they can figure out how much they can get in the sale. And it's always working for the little bit more that they're getting. One in particular, just to give you a sense of this, is one of the most important distinctions for car salesmen is between lookers and buyers. See, there's some people, how many people here have bought a car in the last five years? Raise your hand. How many of you did 90% of your research on the internet? Yeah, that's the way we buy cars nowadays. We don't spend a lot of time in car dealerships anymore. It's not like the old days. We can remember going to five or six dealers. Mostly you go to one or two, you get the best price, you buy the car. Sometimes you don't even go to the car dealership anymore, right? You could do the whole thing online. Unless you're a looker. You see, lookers are people who have no intention of buying cars. They like to drive them. <laughs> they'll come in and they'll test drive four or five different models just because they're car people. If you're a car salesman, you get stuck with a looker, they'll take four or five times as much of your time, you get nothing out of it. It's death to a car salesman, right? So they start to spot lookers as soon as they can and head the other direction. Or if they get stuck with one, they try to get rid of them. How? Push them. Become an aggressive salesman. Tell them how much it's going to cost. They'll leave, you go on to the next thing. Well, here's the punchline. Across the board, car salesmen, by the way, car salesmen of all races, believe that African Americans are more likely to be lookers than whites. The only problem is it's not true. The opposite is true. An entire industry's unconscious behavior is based on a myth. It's not just race and gender that this occurs around. At Johns Hopkins University, they did a study a number of years ago, found that people who are overweight get lower performance reviews for the same performance as people who are seen as physically fit. I did my own study. I've got an artificial knee. I had a full knee replacement a few years ago, so when I go through an airport, I always have to be scanned, you know. So I began to notice that when I was dressed in business clothing, I was going through faster. So I, so I checked it out. I did a study over a period of six months, about 100 times going through these things. Turns out 50% faster when I'm dressed in a certain kind of clothing. Now, a lot of you know that because you've gone to clothing stores on the weekend with your jeans and there's nobody working there, right? <laughs> right? So all of these things are happening. Now, there are hundreds more studies. If we had more time, because we've got precious little time today to, to talk with you about this, we could talk about the various ways impact us, but we know this is happening. And not only that, we intuitively know it's happening, because most of us here have had an experience where we reacted to somebody and then had that aha bonus. Said, oh my God, what was I thinking? Because it affects us in terms of what we see, what we don't see, how we solve problems, what we hear, different distinctions and interpretations. All of those are affected by diversity. All of them are affected by the unconscious, and they affect every single thing in talent management that you're expected to do. It's going on every minute. It's going on right now as you listen to me. It was going on when you chose who to sit next to when you came into this and who you greet and how you greet them and whether at lunch you sat at a table with these people versus those people because you thought they might be interesting and you felt safer. Right. And the question is, what do we do with this? Because we know Scott Page is a professor at University of Michigan whose who's, who's research, he's a mathematician, shows us that diversity does do what we've said for years that it does. It produces greater productivity, it produces greater creativity, much more so than just getting smart people who are all the same. Now, you need to have a core level of understanding of the business, of course, but they've actually proven mathematically. But on the other hand, on the other hand, Bob Putnam is a psychologist at, I mean, a sociologist at Harvard who went and interviewed 30,000 people in the most diverse markets in the country and found that there was, there was breakdown, that people weren't participating in PTAs and civic associations. He called it a turtling effect. People said, does that mean you don't believe in diversity? He says, no. He says, what it means is it's not enough just to throw people together. It's not enough just to get your numbers right. People need to learn to interact with each other appropriately. They need to learn that the more diversity you have, the more work we have to do. So the question is, where will you be on the Page to Putnam pipeline? Are you going to be an organization that now, poised with what you've done, has a benefit of really rocketing ahead in the marketplace because of that? Or are you going to be an organization that now begins to find, in subtle ways, in unconscious ways, as some of the folks up here demonstrated, challenges that you didn't know that you had and that you never had to deal with before?